So I had a man in my previous church, his name was Frank. I, I think I misspoke in the first service this morning. I was thinking it was someone else, but I went back and read his book, uh, actually read his book, and, and uh, it was Frank Sisson. Uh, Frank Sisson served in World War II, and he actually wrote a book about his, uh, about his exploits in World War II. It's called uh, I Marched with Patton. Uh, Frank, uh, Frank passed away in the last year, and um, the way, well, he, he tells this story in his book, and he told me this story a number of times. He was literally in a foxhole. He was literally in a foxhole, and they were in heavy, heavy fighting. It was during the, the Battle of the Bulge, and they were, uh, they were right there with their enemies. It was hand-to-hand combat, and he made a deal with God. He bargained with God and said, God, if you can get me out of this, I will serve you. Frank had no church background at all. He was, uh, in fact, he lied about his age. He was 16 when he joined up. He lied about his age. He had run, he literally, he had to run away from home. He went to California at the age of 14. His mother had died. His dad was not able to take care of all the children. He made his way to California, building, building ships in the shipyard, and then he lied about his age at 16, joined up in the army, and there he found himself, again, in this foxhole, and he, he thought maybe there was a God, but if there was, he bargained with him, and he said, God, if you will get me out of this foxhole, I will live my life for you. And sure enough, sure enough, God, God came through, and well, I don't think that Frank Sisson is the only one that's ever bargained with God. <laughs> have, have you ever bargained with God? God, if you will get me out of this, if you'll get me out of this, I'll start coming to church. God, God if, you, if, you will, if you will make sure that it's a good doctor's report, then I will start reading the, my Bible. God, if, if you will let me win the lottery, then, then I'll be faithful. God, if, if, if you can mend this broken relationship. God, if you can help this car start. We bargain with God, don't we? And, and that's, it's, not a, it's not a horrible place to begin, but some of us have never gone deeper and gone further in our faith than just spending our time bargaining with God. And we will serve God after God comes through for us. Today we're continuing this series dealing with these Old Testament stories that are, these are children's stories. These are stories that, that Veggie Tales redid a few years ago. They did this one, by the way. It's a great one, Rack Shack and Benny. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. It's a really good one. But we, we look at these stories as children's stories, and that's what they are. We retell them to our children. They are in Bible uh, story books for children, and we, we gloss over these stories, and we think, oh, isn't that nice and quaint? God saved three guys in a fiery furnace. But there is a deep lesson there for us, and I believe there certainly is in, in, this, in this story today. The, so the Hebrew people, the Israelites, they had been... They had been in the promised land for about 800 years. You remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about Moses and how God freed the the Israelites through the hands of Moses, how how God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, and then he later called Moses to, to, to help let the people go free. And so the people wandered around in the wilderness for about 40 years and then came into the promised land, and they were there in the promised land for about 800 years. But over that 800 years, the people, the Hebrew people, they began, to, they began to stray from the one true God. They began to worship other gods. They began, they began to, uh, to take on the practices and the pagan practices of, of others around them, and God was not pleased with them. In fact, he was so displeased with them that he allowed enemies to come in and conquer them. In the year 721... In the year 721, the Assyrian Empire, they came into Israel, which was the northern tribes. They came into Israel, and they wiped the Hebrew people out in Israel. In fact, this is how the Assyrians, when they would conquer a country, they would come in and kill as many people as they could find. They didn't kill just thousands or hundreds of thousands. Most biblical scholars believe that the Assyrians killed millions of Jews when they came into Israel in the year 721 B.C. Well, fast forward about almost 125 years in the year 597 B.C. Now, by this time, the Babylonians had overtaken the Assyrians, and so the Babylonians, they were the conquering empire of the ancient Near East. 
But the Babylonians did things differently. Instead of, when they conquered a country, instead of coming in and, and, and just slaughtering millions of people, instead, what they would do, they would come in and they would take the most educated and the wealthiest and the youngest and the strongest, and they would take them into exile back into Babylon. And so they would leave behind the common people, the uneducated, the, the field workers, because they wanted someone back in those old countries to be able to take care of the flocks and the herds and, 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 and all of the crops so that they could then pay taxes to Babylon. So here in our story, we find that Daniel and three of his friends, they are taken into exile into Babylon. They were the cream of the crop. They would have been highly educated. They likely were young men as well. And when, when they were taken into exile, they were enculturated into the Babylonian culture. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that God had set apart the Hebrew people as very unique people. They were holy. God had set them apart. That's what the word holy means. God had set them apart, and they were set apart in every aspect of their lives. If you read through Deuteronomy and Leviticus, you will see how, how much of the minutia of their lives they were to be set apart in. They were to be set apart in almost every part of their actions. They were, they were to be set apart in what food they, what food they ate, what, what, what they did each and every day. Their relationships, especially, especially they were set apart in their belief that there was only one true God. That was very unique in the ancient Near East. All these other countries, all these other empires, they had a plethora of gods, a pantheon of gods. But the Hebrew people were to worship only one, one God. And so when these four men, Daniel and his three friends, when they got to Babylon, the Babylonians were trying to enculturate them. The Babylonians went so far as they changed these three men's names. They changed their names, made them into Babylonian names. They had Hebrew names, and they were just fine. Daniel's name in Hebrew means God is my judge. God is my judge. But in Babylon, his name was changed to Beltachazar, which means Bel is my judge. Bel was a Babylonian god. Hananiah's name in Hebrew means God is gracious. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Mishael's name means who is like God. Well, his name was changed in, in, Babylon, in, in Babylonian to Meshach, which, believes, which, which means who is like Venus. And finally, Azariah's name in Hebrew meant the Lord is my helper, but his name was changed to Abednego, which means the worship of the worshiper of Nego, which is a Babylonian god. And so their names were changed. You see how far the Babylonians were trying to enculturate them into the Babylonian culture? Not only their names, but they also were given Babylonian food. And again, if you've read through the Old Testament, you know that there were dozens and dozens of food laws. There were so many restrictions on what the Hebrew people could eat and could not eat eat. So they were being force fed this food. And finally, Daniel and his friends went to the king and said, uh, we believe, we believe that uh, the way that our God has told us to, to eat is the right way for us to eat. And, and when you're asking us to eat these rich foods, our bodies are not used to that. And so if you, let's, let's try this for a couple of weeks, just for a couple of weeks, let us try to eat the, the foods that God has told us to eat, our God has told us to eat, and we'll see where we stand after a couple of weeks. And so sure enough, sure enough, the rulers decided that they would then let Daniel and his friends, they would eat what, what God had commanded them in the Old Testament to eat, and so that's what they did. And sure enough, at the end of those couple of weeks, these Hebrew men who had been sticking to this diet that they had been commanded by God to stick to, they looked far better than the others. You see how far they had been, they had been trying to be enculturated into that Babylonian culture. So Daniel, Daniel, really the leader of this ragtag group, he had a, 
he had the ability to interpret dreams. And he became very prominent and very powerful in the government. Nebuchadnezzar continued to, rise, to, to raise him up in, in the government. And because of that, Daniel and the other Hebrews, they made some very, very powerful enemies as well. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, like a good king, he was simply trying to keep his country together and unify his country. And so his advisors came up with this great, fantastic idea. Build a big statue, and then when we start playing music, everybody must bow down and worship that statue. Sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? And it was a great plan for all of the Babylonians. They were quick to do that. But you remember what God had told the Hebrew people, they are to worship no one else. They were to worship no thing else because there is only one true God. And so, as the, the, the scripture literally says, as the people were hearing the band strike up, they were falling to their knees. In other words, what it was saying was immediately when the people heard the music start, immediately they fell to their knees and they bowed their knee to the idol. Instead, except these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He heard that these three men were not bowing down and, and worshiping this idol. This, well, this idol that was intended to be a unifier. And so he went to them. And, and said, guys, you, you, you've got you've to bow down and worship. For the good of the country, you've, you've just simply got to bow down and, and worship this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, then our God, who, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had threatened anyone who did not bow down and worship them to be thrown into a fiery furnace, to, be, to, to, to die from fire. To die from fire. And so they said, here's an incredible statement of faith, and I think it's a, it's a lesson that we need to hear. They said, our God is able. Our God is able to rescue us from this fiery furnace. Now think about this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not seen that their God was able to stop a lot of things. I am certain when they were back in, in Judah, they had been praying that God would keep the Babylonians from, from, from sweeping through Judah. I am certain that they had prayed that the Babylonians would not ransack Jerusalem. I am certain that they had prayed that, they would not, that the Babylonians would not tear down the temple, but that's what's happened. And I am also very certain that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had prayed that they would not be part of of the great exile and to be taken into exile in Babylon. I am certain that they had prayed to the Lord that they might, that they might live in their home country, but that's not what happened. I am certain that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though they had not seen God come through time and again, they stood there in front of the king and said, our God is able. Our God is able to do this. We may not have seen him rescue us before, but we are certain that our God is able to do so. It's convicting for me anyway. It's convicting for me. When we, when we face despair, when we face disappointment, when we face pain and difficult talk, doctor's diagnosis, we need to be able to say, our God is able. Our God is able to rescue us. Our God is able. But then comes the most, I think, the most astounding statement of faith in all of the Bible. They say, our God is able. Our God is able, but if not. But if our God does not save us, we will still not bow the knee to this idol. We believe that our God can, but if he does not. Oh, such faith. Oh, such faith. 
I have the kind of faith, oftentimes, that I want to bargain with God. God, if you will do this, then I will serve you. These three men are saying, even if God doesn't come through, I'm going to serve God and God alone. It's astounding. Even if God doesn't come through, we are going to stand firm and we are not going to bow our knee to the idol. If I was writing the story, I would have ended the story there. I would have had God sweep right through. I would have had God change Nebuchadnezzar's mind and the men go free and worship as, as they needed to. But that's not how the story goes. And that's not what happened. Instead, Nebuchadnezzar was furious. In fact, he, he heated the, the kiln. Most scholars believe it likely was the kiln that had been used to cast that large statue, that 90-foot statue. Think how big that is, about twice, the, about twice the height of our bell tower. When you leave church this morning, go up and look how high that is, twice that high. I, it, again, I, I would have I rescued them from the fiery furnace. But that's not what God did. Instead, God saved them in the fiery furnace. Don't let that be lost on, on you. Don't let that be lost here. God does not save them from the fiery furnace. God saved them in the fiery furnace. And that's how so often it is in our own lives, isn't it? We ask God that God, would, that God would save us from the disappointment and despair and pain and frustration. Instead, God saves us in the midst of despair and disappointment and pain and frustration. And glory to God, there were not just three men in that fiery furnace. There were four, and the scripture says they look, he looked as one who was a son of the gods. This was the son of God. Right there in the midst of the fiery furnace, saving Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not from the flames, but in the midst of the flames. The story goes on and says that as, as the men were brought out, not even their, their clothes weren't singed. They didn't even smell of smoke. And Nebuchadnezzar, he repented and said, surely your God is the true God. You see, I believe, and this is what I have found, when we stand firm, when we don't bow the knee to the idol, others notice. Others notice. And dear sisters and brothers, we are in a culture that is not very much unlike the Babylonian culture. There are many gods in our culture. There is so much pressure on us as a church to change what we believe each and every day. We are looked at as, as country bumpkins because we believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We are looked at as religious fanatics when we believe that the Bible really is the Word of God. But we must not bow the knee to our culture. We must not bow the knee to, our, to the idols of our times because God will always save us. He may not save us from the fire, but no doubt God will save us in the fire. We are called to have such faith. Such faith that says our God is able, but even if he does not, we will not bow down and, some, and, 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 and worship something that is false because we serve one true Lord, and he is our God, nothing else. Would you bow with me? Oh, Lord, indeed, we are so tempted and so lured to worship other things, to bow the knee to the false idols that are out there that we're confronted with each and every day. Oh, God, help us to never bow the knee, but instead help us to respond, our God is able Come what may, our God is able to rescue us, but even, O oh Lord, if you do not, we will not bow down and worship the things of this culture. No way, no how, because you are the one true God. 
And, oh, Lord, in the midst of flames of life, in the midst of the fiery furnaces of our culture, oh, God, we know that you save. Time and time and time again. Help us to be faithful in the midst of our fiery furnaces. Help us to be faithful in the midst of pressure to, uh, to bow down and worship false idols. Help us to make a stand today that we will worship nothing, absolutely nothing but you, for you are the one true God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.